So we're going to start uh, the session, as you've heard, by talking a little bit about the theory of, um, of how we analyze patients with congenital heart disease, or in fact any patient, um, by echo or morphologic analysis. So the process uh, that we're going to discuss then is um, sequential segmental analysis. And many of you, I'm sure, will recognize these two fellows, um, Bob Anderson on the right-hand side and uh, Richard Van Prague on the left-hand side. And as you know, over the years, um, there's been two systems that have uh, been promoted um, on either side of the Atlantic. And they've really now been being joined together into an international uh, pediatric cardiology code. So that process is still going on. Um, has been uh, happening for many, many years. But I think the, the overall understanding of the way we analyze congenital heart disease um, is pretty much uh, now set in stone. So that's what I want to describe to you in this first session because congenital malformations are not, of course, always difficult to analyze. So the uh, simple lesions such as ASDs, PDA, or VSD really give very few problems. Um, in analysis, though we can have some problems with terminology. Uh, but it's really when we come to the much more complicated malformations, such as patients with congenitally corrected transposition, um, or where the parts of the heart are not in their anticipated position, uh, that we, run into, we can run into problems. So then we need a logical approach for analysis. We need to um, go through the heart in a standardized uh, way so that we can account for anything that we're going to come across, any possibility. Now, the principle, and this, this is the principle, in fact, that was set out initially by Richard Van Prog um, and then adopted by, uh, by others, is that we analyze the heart in three parts, in three segments, and then look at the patterns within each segment. And those patterns will be limited, um, and that will give us a limited uh, way in which those segments can connect. But of course it's crucially important to look at all of the other associated problems such as uh, ASDs and um, obstructions. So here's an example of a, a pediatric heart specimen, human heart specimen in fact, and you can see the three segments uh, we're going to look at in just a minute. The atrial segment just there, here's the larger ventricular segment and then the third segment, of course, are the great arteries. And we need to analyze each of those individually and then work out how they are uh, connected together. So the question is, how do we determine the morphology of each of those segments? How do we know that a left ventricle is a left ventricle, um, regardless of its position within the chest, for instance? Um, and the, the method that we used, um, and this was designated some years ago, is called the morphologic method. So you'll be very aware that most of those segments have many component parts. For instance, the ventricles have an inlet, an outlet, an apical component. And we could potentially use any of those to define uh, a particular segment. Um, now, of course, the most logical uh, thing to do is to use the component which is present in most people um, as the defining feature. And that's really the, uh, the, the, what we call the morphologic method. So we use a feature that's always or almost always going to be present in patients both with congenital heart disease and um, in normally connected uh, hearts. So that's what I'm going to emphasize in the next uh, session, in the next um, uh, few slides rather. The, um, starting off with the atriums then, there are of course many different uh, anatomic components. And probably the one that we focus on most in echocardiography uh, are the venous connections. Um, so the pulmonary veins coming into the left side of the heart and the SVC and IVC coming into the right side of the heart. And I'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll explain um, how we determine situs uh, by looking at those. But of course there are other components that we could consider. The septal component we're going to discuss uh, uh, in the next session, um, separating the right and the left atrial chambers. There's then a segment here which is larger on the left than the right hand side and we call this the body. 
So most of the body, this is the primitive part of the atrium, and then most of this ends up on the left-hand side. We've then got um, two uh, smaller parts of the atrium immediately above the AV valves, and we call these the vestibule. And then finally, of course, we've got the appendages. And you'll notice the appendage is much larger on the right, or occupies a greater proportion of the atrium on the right than it does on the left. Now, if you look at patients with congenital heart disease, then it's the appendages which are present almost always and can be used to determine um, a left from a right uh, atrium. So it's the appendage which is the most constant component. So let's look at the typical arrangement of uh, appendages in a normal heart. First of all, you can see the right appendage is, is uh, tr essentially triangular in shape. But perhaps more importantly, at least anatomically, um, are, is the internal morphologies, these, these, uh, these trabeculations or pectinate muscles, which uh, extend from the tip of the appendage all the way around the atrioventricular junction on the right side. So if it's a morphologic right appendage, then you'll get extensive uh, pectinate muscles. And there you can see them running all the way around to the level of the coronary sinus. And that's, of course, in quite a uh, sharp contrast to the left side of the heart. The left appendage, as you know, is a, is a very popular um, structure within the heart these days. Several people are trying to close them off um, in patients with arrhythmia. And you can see that in com contrast to the right, it has a very, um, a very narrow uh, neck and is much more tubular. But when you look inside, you can see that most of the left atrium here is in fact smooth-walled. There are pectinate muscles contained on the left side, but they tend to be in the tip of the appendage, um, and most of the wall is in fact smooth. So actually that's the best way for identifying uh, a left, a morphologic left atrium, um, is to look for the pectinate muscles. So we've got our two different types of uh, appendage, and that gives us then, logically gives us four types of atrial arrangement. We can have usual atrial arrangement, as I've just shown you. We can have um, mirror imagery, or situs inversus, uh, fairly logical. And then we can have uh, the situation where we've got bilateral right or bilateral left appendages. And they're the only four possible types of atrial arrangement that you can come across. Now in the past, these the latter two have been grouped under the term situs ambiguous, um, but we now feel that you can separate these easily into either right or, or left isomerism. And here's an example. This is a fetal heart. So the whole thing is about the size of my thumb. And um, you'll appreciate that even at this stage, and in fact particularly at this age, uh, it's the pectinate muscles which for us are are the crucial feature because as soon as you look inside you can see the uh, array of pectinate muscles here on the on this left sided appendage and see that it matches the pectinate muscles on the right sided appendage you can see those within a few seconds but if you try to look at the shape at this uh, gestation at this uh, age then uh, you'd find it much more difficult so pectinate muscles are a very good uh, guide and really are the anatomic gold standard. So the question is then, why do we look at the vessels within the abdomen um, on echo? Well, um, the answer is that most of the time, the situs of the heart will fit the arrangement uh, below the abdomen. So the abdominal situs will fit the thoracic situs. Um, so um, we can have usual mirror imagery, right isomerism or left isomerism uh, within, the, within the abdomen. So um, what we're looking at on echo, of course, is in general the, the arrangement of the vessels in the abdomen, and I'm sure Jan will emphasize this more. Um, but they are reflecting the arrangement of the abdominal situs, which we hope will match the thoracic situs. So we can have two arrangements in the setting with uh, lateralized uh, parts to the body. So lateralized arrangements, usual arrangement as you can see with uh, trilobe right and bilobe left lung, uh, usual atrial arrangement. And usually of course that's associated 
with lateralization within the abdomen and a uh, right-sided IVC and a left-sided descending aorta. And then fairly logically in mirror imagery, the thoracic arrangement, the arrangement of the lungs usually matches the heart, the appendages. The uh, abdominal arrangement is the mirror image of normal and as you'd expect, the IVC is on the left and the descending order on the right hand side. So they're the lateralized arrangement and then um, to complete the picture in isomerism, right isomerism, we get duplication as you know, right sided structures, they tend to get a midline liver and no spleen and in this setting the IVC will be present usually. Um, but is usually next to the descending aorta and it can be either on the right or the left hand side. Both can be on the left or the right hand side. In left isomerism then we get bilateral left structures and duplication of left sided structures such as the spleen um, and because the IVC is a right sided structure we tend to get interruption or absence of the IVC with azagous continuation. And of course the descending aorta can potentially be on either side. So that's uh, the differences in abdominal arrangement and that's why we look at the arrangements of the vessels um, below the level of the diaphragm. So that's the atrial uh, chambers. Let's move on to look at the ventricles. Um, for many years actually the ventricles have been there's been a lot of debate about how we should talk about ventricles, whether they should be divided into two or three components. You'll have probably heard of the terms sinus and conus used uh, within the literature. I think there's pretty good evidence these days that ventricles have uh, three parts to them, um, an inlet, an apical and an outlet component. And the reason I say that is that even in patients which have um, maybe function of ventricular circulation where a ventricle has no inlet or outlet you can still find the remaining third uh, component. So um, here is a, a, a um, classical picture of a right ventricle and you can see the right ventricle extends from the AV junction to the level of the pulmonary valve and we typically divide the right ventricle into three parts. So the inlet component which will extend from the AV junction to the distal attachment of the papillary muscles of the tricuspid valve. The apical trabecular component uh, which extends from that point to this muscle bundle which is the septum marginal trabeculation and the outlet component which is the remainder. So on the right side it's fairly easy to divide into three component parts. On the, left, uh, on the left side as we'll see it's slightly more difficult. Just to focus then on the apical trabecular component, um, you can see on the right side it's particularly coarse. You can see these thick muscle bundles which tend to fill in the apex of the right ventricle. And these again are the most constant feature uh, within the uh, ventricular segment of the heart. So it's the trabecular nature really of the ventricles which would be the gold standard. Although of course we can look at other things such as the attachments of the AV valves and the offsetting of the AV valves on echo. So that's the right ventricle. The left ventricle I say is slightly more difficult um, to define some of the components. Certainly the inlet we can define as extending from the AV junction to the distal attachment of the papillary muscles. Um, the apical trabecular component is really this region here which contains very fine trabeculations but you'll appreciate that there's uh, continuity between the apical trabecular and the outlet component. There's no anatomic landmark that you can say is dividing those two structures specifically. But nonetheless you can divide into three, uh, three major parts. And as I said on the left side the trabeculations are characteristic, they are fine, they are crisscrossing and they tend, uh, they tend to fall against the compact myocardium during the cardiac cycle during systole um, and so they're much more difficult to see on echocardiography. And that gives the left ventricle its smooth uh, surface that you see on echo. So that's how you'd recognize a morphologic left ventricle, although I can, again I have to say that you can look at the structure of the AV valves as well.
So the apical trabecular component that's the most important thing for the ventricular side. Now I've shown you so far morphologic right, morphologic left ventricle. There's one other type of ventricle that I need to show you, which is in fact extremely rare. Um, you're going to come across one or two cases probably in your entire um, career. And that's a situation where we just have one chamber within the heart. We can't, there's no evidence for any other uh, ventricular component. And in that setting, which we call a solitary and indeterminate ventricle, in that setting then we have extremely coarse trabeculations throughout the, throughout the heart. It looks more like a right than a left, but extremely coarse trabeculations. So here you can see two valves coming into the same ventricle, and the ventricle has these very coarse trabeculations on both sides. So just to show you what you can get in extreme um, situations. So trabeculations are, are, are the best way uh, of identifying ventricular morphology. Um, but just for completeness, I thought I'd just show you um, that the ventricles, when we have two ventricles, um, can be arranged in two different spatial uh, arrangements. And we often refer to this as topology of the ventricular mass. Um, is similar to looping, um, L-loop and D-loop. Um, and this is, again, is pretty much accepted across, uh, across the world now. So you'll see in the, in, the, in the typical situation, if we look at the morphologic right ventricle, we're focusing just on the right ventricle, then the arrangement of the inlet, apical and outlet portions of the heart um, can be likened to our right hand. So our thumbs have to be in the inlet and our fingers in the outlet um, with our hand facing the septum. So that's the typical situation, but you'll appreciate that in some patients we have the mirror image of that. So for instance, in patients with congenitally corrected transposition, we can have the mirror image of that arrangement and that of then can be likened to our left hand. So we call that left hand ventricular typology. Now, in most patients, you, won't, you probably won't bother uh, defining the topology because in most patients, it won't make much difference. Um, but in certain situations, as I'll show you in a minute, um, such as isomerism, it can be important and can have important consequences for knowing where the conduction system uh, lies. So that's the ventricles. Let's move on to the third component of the heart that we need to analyze, which is the great arteries. Um, now there's, not, there's nothing really um, intrinsic within the great arteries which, which helps us. Um, so really we look at the branching pattern of the great arteries and we see um, the different, uh, um, how the different branching pattern varies. And that gives us four types of arterial trunk. So aortic trunk giving rise to the coronaries and to the head and neck vessels. Pulmonary trunk which would give rise to the left and right pulmonary arteries. And then two further types which are very similar. Um, common arterial trunk which gives rise to all of the vessels and solitary arterial trunk which gives rise to also to all the vessels but none of the pulmonary arteries arise from within the pericardial sac. You see they're supplied by collateral vessels. Now you may ask, may ask why do we need to separate this group out? Well, they are very similar. Um, but the reason is we don't know where the pulmonary arteries originated um, initially. So they may have originated from the heart, from the ventricular mass, or from the trunk. And as we can't exactly determine uh, where their origin is, we, strictly speaking, should call this solitary arterial trunk. So that's a situation with pulmonary arteries that are not uh, within the pericardial space. So there are the four possible types of arterial trunk, and these are the different variations that I've described to you within each of the segments. So there is a limited number of ways things can vary, and therefore a limited number uh, of ways in which those different parts can connect uh, to one another. So let me just um, move on then. Let's move on to look at the connection between the segments. So we need to work out, once we've worked, once we've looked at the morphology, we need to work out how the segments are joined together, how the atriums are joined to the ventricles, and how the ventricles join to the arterial trunks. 
And of course, in the normal heart, there will be two on each side. There will be two um, connections, the atrioventricular and the ventricular arterial level. But that's not always uh, the case, as I'll show you. So if we look at um, the possibilities within um, uh, congenitally malformed hearts then, the first group are those with biventricular AV connections, so each atrium connected to its own ventricle. And uh, as you can see, if each atrium is connected to its appropriate ventricle, uh, we call this concordant AV connections. And the only way we can have concordant AV connections is either the situation I'm showing you there with udulate arrangement or with mirror imagery of both the atriums and the ventricles. Um, and we still have a concordant AV connection. So the alternative would be that each atrium is connected to an incorrect uh, ventricle. So uh, discordant AV connections and um, logically we can again have that with usual H arrangement or mirror imagery um, to both give us uh, discordant AV connections. So I think they're the fairly straightforward ones to look at. When we come to look at situation with isomerism, then things get a little bit more complicated. And in the past, again, uh, this was referred to as ambiguous, so ambiguous AV connections. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is that if you put two ventricles beneath this, these atriums, this could be right or this could be left. I'm showing you right isomerism in this example. Then part of the heart is concordant and part of the heart is discordant and that's the reason for the term am ambiguous. I think it's probably better to call this biventricular and uh, mixed connections and of course you can get that in the setting of right or left hand ventricular topology again. So I think in this setting it is important to determine the morphology of the ventricles, the topology of the ventricles rather. Um, because it's not designated by the type of connection. So they're the types with biventricular AV connections. And before I move on to look at the, uh, the other types, I just wanted to emphasize how we deal with overriding valves. So this could be AV valves or could be arterial valves. Um, and we need to have a mechanism for saying what is concordant, versus what is uh, double inlet, for instance. And the principle that we use is called the 50% rule. And we look, at the situ we look at the amount of the valvular circumference, which is overriding the crest of the ventricular septum. So I'm showing you here an example in which there's overriding and straddling of the tricuspid valve. But it's the override which we uh, uh, are focusing on here in this, in this particular talk. And you can see that in this case, less than 50% of the tricuspid valve is connected to the morphologic left ventricle. So if less than 50% is connected, we still call this a concordant AV uh, connection. If the tricuspid valve moves further over towards the left side, and we have greater than 50%, um, uh, connection, then we would call this double in that left ventricle. So it's simply an arbitrary rule uh, which we use for uh, determining uh, the connection of the ventricles. Of course, it probably doesn't matter whether it's 49% or 51%. Um, it, it, uh, clinically, it probably won't matter that much, but it's, uh, it's the rule that we use. So that's the 50% rule. And that applies to AV valves as well as um, to arterial valves. So that's the situation with biventricular connections. Of course, then there's uh, a, a quite a, a large group, which we'll discuss on the second day, um, with univentricular AV connections. And you can have any form of atrial arrangement uh, connected to any form of ventricle. And the three different types of connection are best described as absent right, absent left, or double inlet uh, connections. Um, and we'll show you some examples of those as we, as we go through the course. Let me just finish by showing you the different types of, um, of arterial connection. So again, when we have the pulmonary trunk and aorta connected correctly, we call this concordant uh, ventricular arterial connections. 
Situation in transposition is probably better described as discordant ventricular arterial connections, or we can have both arteries coming from uh, one ventricle, and most often that will be from the right side uh, of the heart. So that's the situation with two great arteries coming from the heart, and here's an example, again in a fetus, uh, showing um, double outlet, clear double outlet right ventricle. You can see a big aorta on this side. Um, with the two arterial valves and a smaller pulmonary trunk on this side. Now, in fact, this, uh, this is um, quite an extensive defect. It goes right up to the underside of the arterial valves, so it's also juxta-arterial as well as being uh, a double outlet right ventricle. But both of these valves, you can see, are fully committed to this right side of the heart. So the final group then are simply those with a single outlet, and we can have a single outlet with any of the forms of um, arterial trunk uh, that I've described to you already. So it could be to a pulmonary trunk, could be to an aorta, common trunk, or a solitary uh, arterial trunk. So there are fairly limited number of ways um, in which the arteries can connect. Here's an example um, showing you uh, showing you a rather unusual arterial connection. Um, so here you can see a big vessel coming from this ventricular mass. There's a, there's a big ventricular septal defect. Again, it's a small, uh, small heart, this one. Now this was diagnosed as having common arterial trunk uh, in utero. And you can see why, because coming from the underside of this aortic arch, you can see a vessel, you can see a a branch which looks like a pulmonary artery. This is in fact the left pulmonary artery which is connected by a left-sided duct to the underside of the aorta. Um, and you can see head and neck vessels coming from the arch uh, in addition. Um, but uh, when you look at this anatomically you can see that there is a tiny strand here sitting behind uh, the aorta. So, Although it was diagnosed as common arterial trunk, in fact, this is pulmonary atresia. This is a single outlet from the heart um, into an aorta with um, non-confluent pulmonary arteries. So that tiny pulmonary trunk there leads up and joins onto the right-sided pulmonary artery just there, but not doesn't join onto the left pulmonary artery itself. So the right pulmonary artery is supplied via uh, a right-sided arterial duct. So sometimes you can uh, get slightly different diagnoses anatomically from uh, echocardiographically, but it illustrates the principle. So essentially what I've shown you so far is that um, we build up a cascade of information, we build up information uh, in a logical manner. So we look at the morphology of the segments, uh, that then enables to work out, us to work out the connections between the segments. And then on top of that, of course, we'd need to look at all of the associated malformations um, that are possible. And that really then gives us a very uh, uh, logical way of approaching the heart. It's um, a language that can be used across disciplines. Um, can be, you can use uh, to speak to parents. You can use to, I can use when I'm, we're discussing with the um, molecular cardiologists, what they're creating in mouse uh, knockout models. Um, and it should account for, for uh, all the cases because it simply describes uh, what you're seeing. Thank you. To simplify the information, I th think everybody will be eager and looking forward to hear your coming seven lectures. <laughs> Is there any question? No? Yes, Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much for this nice, beautiful lecture. You've co commented about the usual, common, and unusual also arrangement. The only thing which I would like to ask is in the setup of a normal, I mean, concordant atrioventricular connection and discordant ventricular arterial connection, but in this setup where the great vessels arise from the left ventricle, so double outlet left ventricle. Oh. In, that, in that case, which is I know it's very rare, 
and I, I, I do believe it exists, but what is the, the, the spatial relationship of the great arteries in that sort of unusual connection? Well, usually the spatial, the spatial arrangement could potentially be anything, but it's usually with an aorta anterior to the pulmonary trunk, and that can either be, I've seen them either to the left or to the right hand side. So the, auto, the, the arteries will be parallel, tend to be more, uh, tend to be parallel. And this, the only cases that I've seen that are convincing of double outlet left ventricle tend to be the heart with a big left ventricular chamber and a, a really tiny right ventricle um, or a very big ventricular septal defect. So the aorta really has no the aorta really has no choice but to be connected mainly to the left-hand side. They're, they're the main, they're the main um, types that I've seen. But yeah. the aorta, I think in all those cases I've seen, the aorta is anterior uh, and the arteries are yeah. parallel to one another. I know that's your, uh, I, I think that is your, your answer, but we've seen at least three cases uh -huh. and all of them, the pulmonary arteries anterior and to the left. Interesting. So okay. it was very... <laughs> And the other connections, this is in the setting of, of concordant... Concord atrioventricular, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the only very unusual case, it shows that anything can happen <laughs> and you have to analyze, yeah. You, you certainly yeah. have to analyze things. Uh, yeah. um, it's uh, always very useful for the pediatric cardiologist to go back and review the pathology. Uh, Dr. Kogu started with the uh, atrium and then ventricle and the uh, outlet. But uh, there is uh, also a very important part of the heart, uh, which is the systemic veins, both uh, bony veins and uh, systemic veins, which is, I think, sometimes is very difficult and can mix up. So hopefully that we can see maybe uh, another lecture. I think it's uh, worth it and uh, very important. No, absolutely. I mean, it's all part of really analyzing the, I guess we'd say it's part of analyzing the atriums, um, is to look at the, the, the venous uh, connections. Um, so, yeah, we consider it as part of the atriums, but it's, it's the starting point, I guess, yeah, of the analysis. Um, um, a question. Um, in the context of AV discordance, you know, atrioventricular discordance mm -hmm. and a single ventricle of whatever morphology, how correct to describe the AV valves as being left and right versus tricuspid or mitral? So you're saying in the setting of discordance? Of AV discordance, you know, atrioventricular discordance, and then you have a single ventricle of, you know, whatever morphology. Is it still correct to describe it as being a tricuspid or mitral, or just to call it left and right? Um, I mean, most of the time you can talk. If you, uh, sorry, yeah. I mean, it, if if the connection is is a discordant AV connection, right. you can still talk about them as tricuspid or mitral valves. Um, in the setting of a, a, a univentricular connection, so double inlet left ventricle, right. or double right. inlet right. Um, I think you're better off talking about them as right and left AV valves, but simply because they don't, they don't look like tricuspid or mitral. So in double inlet left, then most of the time they'll look like mitral valves, for instance. So um, yeah, in the setting of discordant AV connections, you can talk about 